This reoccurring quote throughout the film sums up the entire theme of the whole story. The film is about characters' relationships with God and being tested by the worst possible events. At its very core, the narrative explores the question, how far are you willing to go for those you love? Prisoners is an intense graphic thriller that really asks the audience to engage with deep questions of the film as you go through this suspenseful journey. It presents different reactions to the scenario but makes no clear cut answer for those difficult moral questions. The subject matter evokes our core perception of humanity and its relationship with the law system, building from low levels of fear and uneasiness to incredible suspense and ultimately a climactic ending. Prisoners ranks itself among other investigation thrillers such as Silence of the Lambs, Zodiac and Seven. This analysis will focus on the themes of faith and the testing of faith. Through these characters past they have all come to develop different levels of faith, but all as a means to deal with the dramatic and tragic experiences in their lives, making Prisoners a very human and powerful film. The title Prisoners is so appropriate here. Even though several characters are literally in prison during the film, all characters act and make decisions as if in a psychological prison of their own individual pasts and the horrible events of the film. To fully understand other characters in the film we must first explore Keller. All other characters are wrapped around him and his drive to save his daughter. I know your dad was a dart at Greaterford. Keller's father was a prison guard and committed suicide when Keller was a teenager. Keller and his mother found the father in their home. No note was left and no comment was made by the prison service after 14 years of work. This for me is a possible point where faith has become a bigger part of Keller's life. As a result of this tragic childhood experience, Keller has grown up into a father who puts his family at the highest priority, and through his preparation to ensure their safety at all times, has become a man in need of control. Keller's faith in the film is outweighed by his need for control, and this is one of the reasons that Keller's faith is tested because of his sense of responsibility when his daughter is taken. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. Keller's faith is clear at the beginning of the film, as he is introduced through prayer, sacrifice, symbols of faith, and states the fact that he is a carpenter. I thought maybe you'd forget it. I barely get enough carpentry work to keep up with a mortgage. These elements of faith are compounded with several shots that position Keller and his daughter close together to later emphasize the idea of being torn apart and separated from these characters. Once his daughter is taking the feelings of personal responsibility is a heavy realization, which is seen through his wife. Why can't you make her go home? And through the toothbrush scene. The dream sequence foreshadows that he will find his daughter and the whistle. The whistle is the physical key to survival, but the hole he stays in is the final test of his faith. During his stay in the hole, he doesn't realize that Loki has saved his daughters, and the last communication with the auntie states that she will kill the girls. So at this point, Keller faces his darkest mental prison, total lack of control, being helpless for his daughters and facing his own death. Despite committing some terrible actions in the film in the name of good for his daughters, my theory is that Keller reaches a place of redemption by the end of the film. After finding the whistle, it's enough hope and closeness to his daughter that allows him to restore his faith and ultimately leading to his rescue. The two elements that save Keller are the whistle and Loki. The whistle exists through Keller's obsession for control and the preparation and Loki will be explored later but is connected to Keller in a lot of ways and in some ways is God's answer to Keller's prayers, making the point that Keller's redemption is rewarded by the presence of Loki. There is even a moment of pure darkness when with Keller, as if giving the character a private moment to really reconnect with his final action of the film, being engaged in prayer. It's a fitting parallel for Keller's final action to be prayer, which is answered by his rescue, as this bookends our introduction to Keller as his first words of the film are Keller's prayers. 
or forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. One of Keller's reasons for taking matters into his own hands is the feelings of frustration with the law system. The pace and procedures of this investigation seems like a waste of precious time to Keller, and the dynamics between Loki and Keller mirror that of a western. Loki is the sheriff and represents the law, and Keller is the outlaw who has a problem with the establishment. Not surprising since this story was originally discussed as a western and then modernised into what we have now. Keller's frustration with Loki is compounded by the age difference between the two men. Keller looks down on Loki and views his youth as naivety and incompetence, giving Keller more of a reason to take control. This radio scene before Keller takes Alex acts as an inner monologue for Keller at this major turning point. This is the moment he completely loses faith in God and the law system. Along with his heavy sense of responsibility and a push from his wife, almost served as guilt, the words in the radio broadcast here are meaningful. The former is a reason why we should be very patient. The latter, why we should be very penitent when we are afflicted. He reminds him that trouble and affliction are what we have all reason to expect in this world. Man is brought into trouble, not as man, but as sinful man. The radio dialogue are Keller's thoughts and something he isn't willing to accept and forces him into taking action. He's a survivalist, a man who thinks he can handle anything. Early in the film, Anna and Joy are seen watching a white rat. Later in the film, when Keller decides to take matters into his own hands and leaves to find Alex, the scene cuts back again to show that the rat is now black, foreshadowing Keller's transition from holy man into sinner. There is also the presence of three elves in the bedroom. The meaning of three elves in terms of dreams is a symbol of wisdom, seriousness and thoughtfulness. Something vague has become clear and their judgement is usually correct, confirming again that Keller truly believes that he is right in taking action in order to save his daughter. In the scene where Keller fights with his son in Anna's room, he pushes him and knocks over Anna's dollhouse, a beautiful parallel to his home metaphorically falling apart. In our first trip to see Alex, the cross in the car is swinging and turned to the side. This represents Keller's faith being tested in the moments when his faith is beginning to fade. Contrast this with the opening scene of Keller and his son, we can see that the cross is fully present and reflected Keller's then stronger faith. Keller's father committed suicide in this house and was found by Keller and his mother. Probably why he doesn't want to go there anymore, probably why he's reluctant to change it, but it's poetic that Keller has to return to this location that tested his faith as a child and shaped him as a man for his faith to be tested once more. Through Keller's acts of anger and vengeance against the innocent Alex, he becomes a demon amongst men, the abductor of another's child and a prisoner of his own obsession, and a prisoner he literally becomes when Holly forces him into the hole. If Loki rescues Keller, he will most likely take him from the hole of imprisonment to a real prison for his actions towards Alex. It's also a fitting role reversal that after trapping Alex, Keller must become entrapped almost as karma for his actions. From what we've discussed, it seems like Keller's intention was to save his daughter, but his journey is more a test of his own faith, and it's Loki that ultimately saves her. However, Keller's actions are not insignificant. Keller's actions indirectly save his daughters. Because he takes Alex, the aunt feels lonely and brings the girls out of the hole. Should have left him down there. I was so lonely without Alex. Allowing Joy to escape and leads Keller back to the hole. But this misdirects Loki into saving Alex, leading Loki to notify the aunt and saving the daughter. Although this is a little long to explain, it's very smart story plotting that tells us that his actions, though morally questionable, are also the catalyst that sparks actions leading to the rescue of his daughter. Spent our summers driving around in that camper with our son, handing out pamphlets, spreading the good word. After our son died of cancer, we started saying things differently. 
Fully understand each character is important to explore the past of each of them because it gives us clues into the kind of person and the beliefs that each of these characters have. The aunt and her husband used to be people of God, handing out pamphlets in the name of God and spreading the good word. Their son got cancer and died and this was a major turning point and test of the faith for this couple. They felt like they were owed a gesture of goodwill after all that they had put in and have their son saved. But since this wasn't the case, they began to wage a war against God as revenge. They thought that others should experience the loss of a child and what it turns parents into. Making children disappear is the war we wage with God. Makes people lose their faith. Turns them into demons like you. I had to slow down since my husband disappeared. I do what I can. The husband and her created new unbelievers, like Alex's real mother. This explains why the husband went to the priest in the first place, to gloat and rub their actions into the face of God. He came to me for confession. He said he'd killed 16 children. He bragged about it. I convinced him to come back here. He said he'd kill more. All characters are battling with a need to be set free. Like Keller and Alex who try to escape physical and metaphorical prisons, she doesn't want her final resting place to be an enclosed coffin. This gives meaning to her final line of the film. Make sure they cremate me. Sure as hell don't want me buried in some box. Both hands right now! Loki's character may be the most interesting and Jake Gyllenhaal's performance really elevates him to a more complex and human figure. Loki's past is less clear. We know he was raised in a boy's home and he is speculated to have engaged in some juvenile criminal activities during his childhood and hinted at abuse during his upbringing. Detective Loki, I think, um, was somewhat of a juvenile criminal himself. Um, you know, he was an orphan pretty young and I don't think he has, I mean, I know that he doesn't have uh, parents that he knew. I think he was sort of shuffled in and out of foster homes and found himself in, you know, juvenile detention system. Um, and then got kind of picked up at a certain point and found his way into another institution, which was really the police department. Um, and so I think that's what makes him so good at a younger age to, you know, at solving crimes like this. Um, you know, He's, he's not really afraid of getting into that world and he's seen many minds like that before. These events are bound to be an emotional burden of his dark past. Loki is now a detective who is confined by the rules of the law. This makes for a very interesting and complex clash of past life and professional judgement during dramatic scenes. Loki is introduced to us alone and never with any mention of family. We approach Loki with a very specific shot of his back. This shot is repeated at three other key moments in the film, usually when Loki is getting closer in the case and something is right under his nose. In this shot, Loki stands a few feet away from the girls who are underneath the car. Loki is still full of rage and is being tested, but is about to stumble into another clue that is right in front of him. Unlike the previous back shots, we begin to move away from him in this shot, as the case is over and he is mentally trying to let this story end and move on, but during this crucial moment we hear the whistle blow, leading to one of the most perfect endings to a suspenseful investigation film. We know that Loki has never failed to solve a case, and I have complete faith in him as a detective to investigate even the slightest possibility, and his drive and thoroughness is what will ultimately lead to Keller's saviour. By saving Keller, he not only solves the case of the missing daughter, but he then ties up all of the loose ends. You can see the lack of satisfaction when Loki meets the daughter in the hospital. You can tell that his mind is still working on the case. Loki has absolute faith in the law system to lead him down the right path eventually, which it does, even if it doesn't match Keller's sense of urgency. Let's explore some of the details that Loki's character reveals. Loki has various tattoos on his body, all of which are a specific narrative purpose. The mere presence of so many tattoos as a detective makes him a questionable character, making his past a prominent part of his character. Loki's neck tattoo is an eight-side pointed star, meaning the symbol of chaos. In Christianity, the eight-pointed star is the star of redemption, or regeneration, or represents baptism. 
This could be significant for the turnaround in his own life or how he helps Keller's character throughout the film, especially the end of the film. Loki strategically uses this tattoo for intimidation, especially when around Alex and during questioning. He covers it up when around the family. Loki's finger tattoos are a version of zodiac symbols or star signs, but don't seem to match any I could find. However, the letters on his fingers roughly form the shape of an M, A, Z, E. The word maze. The word maze runs throughout the film, even the close-ups of his wife's medicine. The Mason Ring means more in America than it does to me, but Chillinghall has stated in an interview that that's sort of a representation of the institution, finding comfort within that space and what that means, particularly in America. Loki has a twitch and blinks repetitively throughout the film, especially during investigation scenes, and I found it to be a way in which it was like expression of an emotional state. He couldn't just emote because it would hurt the case. It could hurt him trying to figure out the case. It would create great doubt. He was just dealing with computing so much that it was almost an overload, like a glitch. The cross on the hand. The only other cross that we see in the film is the one that's in Keller's car and begins to become less and less clear as his faith fades. Loki's is tested at several points in the film and never breaks the law, but is tempted to do at different moments, usually when pushed by Keller or made to feel guilty by Keller. Both men have the same goal of finding the girls and share the belief of pray for the best and prepare for the worst. This phase is one of the main beliefs that Keller embodies and Loki begins to become influenced by as the film goes on. Keller starts with this opinion. You know the most important thing your granddad ever taught me? Hmm? Be ready. Then they both agree during the middle. So with all the survivor gear in there. Pray for the best, prepare for the worst. At least we agree there, yeah? And then at the end, Loki uses it as his own belief. Pray for the best, prepare for the worst, yeah? Right. Loki's actions begin to blur into a more grey area, especially when confronted by Keller, as he's beginning to become more personally invested in the case. Loki's emotional arc starts with, this is just another case, he is very objective. This can be seen when he's dealing more with the logistics than the people in the family. Keller's influence begins to get Loki emotionally invested. Loki battles with this emotion of urgency and is tempted to break the law at several points to make progress. By the end of the film he is completely invested and although he saves the girl, the case for Loki isn't finished until he saves Keller, since it was Keller that inspired him or forced him or guilt tripped him into these actions, he needs to find Keller for closure. Keller and Loki connected through God. The juxtaposition of events in the film are very important and the timing of characters, actions and presence are used to support the narrative themes of the film. Whenever Keller prays to God for help, Loki appears soon after. When Keller confesses to God after hurting Alex and asks for help, Loki appears. When Keller prays for his daughter, we move to Loki saving his daughter. There are other moments but Keller's prayers are always answered by Loki acting soon after. This is why I believe that Keller will be saved at the end of the film. Another frequent visual in the film is that of the single eye. After being tortured by Keller, Alex has one eye that is bruised so much that it is permanently shut. In later scenes, he is filmed so that the light only falls on one open eye. And during the climax, Loki is shot just over his left eye so that the blood seeps in and pops his blood vessel. In Nordic mythology, the god Odin gives up one eye for the three fates in exchange for wisdom. In Prisoners, Alex eventually learns about his own mother. Similarly, Loki is blinded when he discovers the girl, stating the fact that wisdom comes with a price. Snakes are also a religious symbol used in different mythology. Tempting during the Adam and Eve story, Satan is referred to as a snake, and is also a very prominent figure in the Norse mythology. The symbol of Loki is also a circular version of two snakes. It is fitting then that snakes play a prominent presence in the film and something that Loki has to battle against. 
Loki tries to bend the rules as he begins to identify with Keller's character. He is asked to keep Alex in for another day, and although he doesn't commit to anything in front of Keller, he does try to persuade his captain to follow the request. I'll keep holding. Anadorm's father was a mess. I, 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 I get it, I understand, but it's not gonna happen. No, I'm just asking for one more day. Fuck you. Well, you find his daughter, he'll forgive you. If you don't, he's gonna hate you anyway. Loki's second grey action, influenced by Keller, is after the sock ID scene. Keller blames Loki, and as he experiences a moment of reflection, emphasised by his physical reflection in the glass door, despite his best effort and calm demeanour, this scene has had a heavy impact on Loki, and it leads to a major turning point and makes his second grey action because of Keller's pressure. Loki hassles Bob and indirectly gets him killed and loses a potential witness. Also this scene is cross cut with Keller's prayers, maybe telling us that this is a moment where Loki is asking for strength in his prayer. A prayer that Keller can't finish, showing that both men are getting to the end of their wits. Also, when he is asked if Keller will go to prison, the statement of probably hints at a level of sympathy and even doubt as to what should be a very cut clear yes or no based on Keller's actions. Keller and Loki cross during the film. Keller begins intensely and his faith is tested throughout. Loki starts out as if any other case, but begins to really identify with Keller and becomes increasingly invested and during Keller's darkest hours of entrapment, Loki takes over and completes the case that they were both set out to resolve and rescue. This crossover is mirrored by their physical height in the film. In the beginning, Keller looks down on Loki and refuses to sit whenever he is around. Please. Sit down. Uh, uh, and tries to always be above Loki. You so? No. Why would I make this up? Hey, hey, hey. Why, no, no. Think about it. Why would I make this up? I'm not up? saying that. During the middle of the film, Keller becomes more vulnerable and is reluctantly lowered to Loki's level. I'm part of the liquor store. I have a bottle of liquor. And we see him below Loki at the end of the film. Keller has sank so low in terms of his faith that he is below ground level compared to Loki, and it will be Loki's job to raise him back up. The choice of music again emphasised the redemption for Keller and how this time in the hole has been a spiritual journey or rebirth. In the beginning of the film, Keller's journey home is overlapped with the song Put Your Hand In My Hand, a song that speaks about being in step with God and letting him guide you, very much a reflection of Keller's character at that time. of hand in my hand is particularly meaningful as being in sync with God when contrasted with the song choice near the end of the film. As Loki waits and Keller is most likely engaged in prayer, we hear a Radiohead song on the radio. This song has a lot of parallels with the Buddhist spiritual cycle of life, death and rebirth. The song is about the cleansing rebirth and spiritual death and the exploring the unfamiliar within ourselves and abandoning our previous shells. particularly meaningful line which adds meaning to our earlier example is sleight of hand. Keller has done something wrong and is now covering it up. After a traumatic event that seems to have scarred Keller's character, water usually symbolises some of the cleansing and rebirth, paralleling baptism. Hence the water is clear and innocent, in that by jumping off the end into a clear lake and we shed our previous skin and our burdens of our soul, brought about by our mistakes. 
You've done nothing wrong, no one around. Reminds us that the entire process is a personal spiritual experience and is wholesome within ourselves. This song is very instrumental in conveying Keller's redemption of faith, which is most likely be rewarded by Loki's arrival and ultimately his rescue. Alex was the first child they took, perhaps why they kept him as a replacement for their son because they felt they were due. They also might have kept him because of the accident that they hinted at the end of the film. My husband kept snakes. Well, it wasn't that bad what happened, but Alex had a fear of them. That's not my favorite memory. As we know, the father kept snakes and Alex was the first person they kidnapped. They potentially used the snake venom in the drug cocktail they used. Perhaps they hadn't gotten the dosage right and they overdosed him to the point of severe brain damage. She seems pretty confident in the dosage and amount necessary to take down Keller and must have learnt this through repetition and experience. Using subtitles during the shower scene I was able to hear what Alex was saying. While in the shower he says, I was waiting and he never came, I'm not Alex, I just wanted to play and he never came. Keller uses war almost to purify Alex, but with no luck in terms of information. Feeling frustrated, Keller prays to be pardoned for his sins. This scene almost reflects that of a confessionary. This prayer again is answered by Loki's arrival. The maze shown in the film represents the journey of life, death and rebirth that Keller is engaged in. Like all holy journeys, the destination is of moral and spiritual significance. Life is when Keller's home is safe and complete. Death is when Keller's home is broken by the taking of his daughter. Keller becomes a monster due to the wrong done to his family and friends. And rebirth is when he must be granted salvation in order to return to the world as a man. Because the film shows these characters in extraordinary circumstances, we see how different characters react to a test of this level and intensity. The mother turns to drugs, Keller turns to violence, and Franklin turns to non-action or helplessness. In the intense hammer scene, he doesn't contribute to it, but doesn't stop it either, emphasizing his helpless feeling. This feeling of duality is literally shown when he is stuck between the two men. Watching the scene again and watching from his perspective, concentrating on his face during this scene, completely changes how I saw this scene. He is appalled by what his friend is doing, but he is helpless at the same time. The act of non-action says a lot about his character. He battles between the morally questionable actions and the desire to have his daughter back. So many names. Forgot all about Bobby Taylor, till I read about him in the paper. Bob was one of the many unfortunate characters to have been abducted as a child by the auntie and her husband, and luckily escaped, but like the rest of the characters in the film he is haunted by his past. He experiences a memory lapse and inner trauma that drives him crazy, and dealing with the psychological burden that has led him to search and return to the mindset of people like his kidnapper to try and understand what happened to him. The fact that he stole a sock from Keller's family wasn't related to Alex, but just for authenticity for the situation for Bob. The only connection for him in the story that he was taken by the aunt and the husband, and that the books that he read. The maze that he draws and the necklace maze are from the same book, Finding the Invisible Man. It states that if you can solve the maze you can go free, but we see that it is an unsolvable maze. For Bob the gun is the escape from the unsolvable maze, it's life that has caused him pain. The opening shot of the film is very much like the bars of a prison cell, matching the opening imagery with the theme of the film. Early on in the film, the camera is used effectively to give the audience the feeling of somebody watching, all in the effort to increase tension and an uneasy feeling of uncertainty and drama. It shows as a waiting camera, making the audience want to see more and anticipate something coming. The interiors of the house seem gloomy and cramped, with the walls cutting into the frame and characters coming in and out of sight, a visual representation of the idea of people being cut off from one another. There are many scenes in the film with people looking through glass, being close but being separated from. We constantly throughout the film see the actions through glass and from a distance. 
This emphasizes the idea of distance, distrust and separation. These two scenes are very similar and have a lot of parallel moments, especially from Loki's perspective. Loki has to break into both houses and discovers both men asleep on the ground. He follows them through different areas and gets very close to clues of the case. And in terms of the priest scene, he gets close to the maze that he will return to later on the necklace. And in Keller's scene, he gets very close to Alec physically but doesn't discover him until later on in the film. These two repeated scenes along with the back shots that we spoke about earlier emphasize the idea of Loki going through investigation and getting closer and closer over time. The film purposely leaves gaps in the narrative, usually by fading to black as something is about to happen, asking the audience to fill in parts for themselves and be an active participant. This is particularly true for the ending moment of the film, leaving the audience with question and encouraging reflection on the film. For me, the characters have been shaped so well throughout the film that it is clear what will happen after the credits. Prisoners was one of my favourite films from last year, along with Place Beyond the Pines. Denis Villeneuve is quickly becoming one of my favourite filmmakers and I was very pleased that when I dug a little deeper into Prisoners that it always revealed meaning and showed the level of detail that went into making such a suspenseful thriller ride and human story. I'm very excited to see his upcoming film Enemy. I hope you enjoyed this analysis of Prisoners. Feel free to comment and ask questions below. I would love to discover more about this film through our communication. Thank you.